I met my next door neighbor a week after moving into my new home. Our first encounter wasn't very pleasant, but that was par for the course with Jack Werner. He wasn't exactly a pleasant guy. He came barging out of his front door as I walked back into my driveway. As I was stepping out of my car, he pointed and called out, You parked on my lawn! The tires on the passenger side were barely touching the edge of his grass. I wanted to give him a smart-ass reply and walk away, but there was something a little unnerving about the intensity of his stare. Outwardly, the old fella seemed calm enough, but he had the energy of a coiled rattlesnake. I didn't really feel like starting something with a grumpy neighbor, so I gave him an apologetic smile and said, I guess I might be a little too close. Sorry about that. I'm not that great at backing in. He gave me a mocking grin in return and said, Then maybe you should practice and get better at it. You'd start your training right now, Sparky. Hop in your car, do it again. Only this time, keep it the fuck off my lawn. My new neighbor wheeled around and marched back into his house, leaving me standing there with my mouth hanging open. It was only my first week in my new house, and I was already in a feud. Great. I shook my head and took another stab at backing into the driveway. This time, I made sure to leave plenty of room between my car and the razor-sharp edge of his lawn. I didn't much care for how he'd spoken to me, but I had no intention of confronting him about it. This guy was definitely someone to avoid. A couple of days later, I heard a knock on my door shortly before 9pm. I peeked through the spy hole and felt my heart sink. It was my neighbor, looking gruff and weathered in an old t-shirt and faded jeans. I braced myself and opened the door and said, How can I help you? And he gave me a sour grin. Well, you could start by accepting my apology, he replied. And he thrust a six-pack of Miller High Life into my hands. My name's Jack Werner. Sometimes I can be a bit of an asshole. Why don't you come over and drink some beer on my porch? I looked down at the six-pack with dismay. Having a drink with this angry old bastard was absolutely the last thing I wanted to do. I tried to hand back the six-pack, and I said, well, Thank you, but I should really get ready for bed soon. I have to work in the morning. Mr. Warner waved away my excuses and snorted, Who the hell goes to bed at nine o'clock? Bring over those wobbly pops, we'll have ourselves a visit. He was already walking away before I could take another stab at saying no. I muttered, Fuck me, and started to pull my shoes on. I promised myself I would drink exactly one beer in record time, of course, and then I would get the hell out of there. I climbed his front porch steps with great reluctance and sat down across from him on his porch. The citronella candle was flickering on the table between us, making the shadows waver and dance in the aluminum awning above our heads. Mr. Werner raised his glass and said, Glad you can make it, young man. It's a fine evening to sit on your ass and get shitty. Yes, sir. I firmly shook my head and muttered, can't stay very long. I have to get up early in the morning, so... Me, I'm a night owl, he interrupted. I don't sleep so well anymore, so... Make sure you keep it down over there till at least noon. If I ever hear of your lawnmower running before noon, we're gonna have some words. I'm not a child, and I'll do as I please, I said in a pleasant tone, and I pushed back my chair. I think I'll just leave the beer on the table and be on my way. He smirked at me and said, I don't get your knickers in a knot. Fine, go ahead, mow your grass when it's still wet from the dew. Makes a hell of a mess under your deck of your lawnmower. But if that's what you want to do, go for it. I snapped. Thanks, Mr. Werner. Maybe I will. He grinned at my resentful expression and said, Listen, I'm sorry we got off to a bad start. I just didn't want some asshole parking on my lawn. I think it's... Reasonable, don't you? Otherwise, I honestly don't give a rat's ass what you do over there. I just, just keep your vehicle off my grass. Don't make it a habit of waking me up before noon. Sound fair? I reluctantly replied, Yeah, I guess that's fair. And popped open a beer. I'm not much of a drinker. And when I do drink, Miller definitely isn't my first choice. However, it was cold. And it was free. I squinted at the lettering on his t-shirt and the candlelight. It read, If you weren't there, shut the fuck up, in bold lettering. I raised an eyebrow and asked, Do you serve the military, Mr. Werner? Long time ago, he said quietly, and he took another swig from his glass. The content smelled like it was mostly rum with just a light splash of cola for some color. He grimaced at it, burning down his throat. It was drafted into the service... 
Served in Vietnam. I was a Marine. Almost automatically, I said, thank you for your service. I raised my beer and a toast. My new acquaintance gave me a wary frown and shook his head. Nah, he grumbled. Don't say that. I got my draft card in the mail like everyone else. I did my service, came home. It's my duty. I nodded respectfully and said, Vietnam was a long time ago. You're looking good for someone your age. Mr. Werner shrugged and quietly answered, Fuck getting old. That's some pussy shit. I snorted out a surprised laugh and <laughs> had another swig from my can. I said, that's one way to look at it, I guess. How long have you been living here? He thought about it for a second and said, And I've been here about 20 years or so, I guess. He downed a third of his glass and two big swallows and let out a soft groan. He said, After I got divorced, I was a drifter for a while. I traveled around, did a lot of jobs. I planted potatoes in Idaho, harvested peanuts in New Mexico. I lived in Little Rock, Jackson, Fargo. I lived all over the goddamn place. I was a tour guide in the Grand Canyon. A fire lookout in Big Spur. Just buggering around from place to place, always on the move. He drifted off and stared into his glass. I sipped away my beer and waited for him to continue. After a long pause, Jack cleared his throat and said, Doesn't matter much how much space you put between you and the past. It'll follow you. Drowning it out works a lot better. That's all you can do. Mr. Werner guzzled down the rest of his drink and gasped at the burner's throat. He croaked, Generally speaking, I can't stand other people. I no use for him at all. But every now and then I feel like talking. Problem is, everyone I used to know is gone now. One way or another. Me and the bird feeder these days. I nodded in the gloom and said, yeah, Sure, I get that. Everyone needs some company once in a while. What do you want to talk about? Jack snorted. Fuck if I know. He leaned over to pick up a bottle of Captain Morgan that was sitting beside his feet. I'm not usually much of a conversationalist, kiddo. What do you want to talk about? I hesitated. And Jack murmured, Go on, kid. Ask whatever you want. I'm not going to yell at you or nothing. I don't know much about the Vietnam War, to be honest. Uh, just what I've seen in those old war movies. What was it like over there? Jack gave me a sharp look and poured himself another drink. He filled most of the glass with booze, and then he topped it with a small splash from the bottle of no-name cola. What you talking about? Old movies? Platoon? A full metal jacket? Those movies aren't old. What are you, a tadpole? Gone of the wind? That's, that's an old movie. I raised my hands defensively and said, Wasn't even born yet when those movies came out been longer than you think, Mr. Werner. He shook his head and smiled down at the table. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Speaking of those old war movies, I actually went to see The Deer Hunter in the theater. The wife and I had gone out for a nice steak dinner that night. Classy joint, good food. Had a good time. It's me and her. Anyway, when we were walking back to the car, she pointed out a movie marquee and asked, Can we go see The Deer Hunter, Jack? I love Robert De Niro. I'll tell you something, I didn't want to do that at all. Not one fucking bit. Just looking at that movie poster out front made me feel... I don't know. I mean, my chest feel tight, but at that point we were still basically newlyweds. I wanted to make her happy. We didn't hate each other yet. That came later. Anyway, we go in, I pay for the tickets, popcorn, soda, all that crap. We get settled in, movie starts, and it's, it's actually pretty good. Real good drama about some regular working class guys I could I relate, you know. So we're sitting there and we're watching the movie and holding hands, and suddenly the story goes back to when the guys were in the war. A village is getting bombed, they're spraying napalm. And just like that, I wasn't in a theater no more. I was there. I was, I was back in Nam. We were under fire. I could smell cordite and napalm in the air. I could smell the bodies cooking. 
I jumped up, I started screaming for the comms to call in air support. I saw a VC come running out of the dark, out of the corner of my eyes, had a knife in his hand, but I, I was ready for him. I grabbed his wrist, I slammed the heel of my palm into his nose, he went down like a sack of bricks, and I stomped on his head. Someone else grabbed me from behind, and they, they caught an elbow to the teeth, and I dropped to the floor, and I started crawling for cover. I made it to the exit somehow, and I ran for my life. And that... The old man sighed. It was the last time I ever went to a movie theater. I haven't stepped in one since. I stared at him with my mouth hanging open. He stared back, his eyes glimmering in the candlelight. I cleared a sudden thickness from my throat and said, Jesus Christ, that's, that's, um, something else. Yeah, the cops found me in the restroom, Jack murmured. He took a giant swallow of rum, was hiding in a toilet cubicle. The guy I hit was an usher, a teenage kid. He was just coming to see what all the ruckus was about. The knife was his flashlight. I broke his nose. Slowly I asked, Who did you hit with your elbow? My wife, Jack grunted. I broke three of her teeth, split her septum in half, she didn't leave me after that, but, uh, but it was the beginning and the end. I quietly asked, oh, fuck, that's, uh, that's rough. I reached for my beer can. Jack abruptly lashed out with the speed of a cat and slapped it off the table. The can sailed over the railing of his porch and landed somewhere in his front yard. He croaked, go home. I'm done talking. It's time to drink in peace. Go on, get the fuck out of here. I blinked at him in surprise. I slowly pushed my chair back from the table and said, yeah, I think we're done here. Have a good night. Jack fixed his gaze at the wall beside him and I got up from the table. As I started to walk away, he muttered, I don't drink beer. Take it with you. I stammered. Uh, sure, yeah. Thank you. He stared at the wall. Still staring at the wall, Jack made a dismissive motion with his hand and said, You're welcome. I'll go. I tried to watch a movie when I got back, but I, I couldn't get into it. Gave up around 11, and I went to bed. But I couldn't sleep. I stared at the ceiling, and I tried to blank my mind, but I... I couldn't stop thinking. Around one in the morning, I gave up the struggle and went down to rummage through the fridge. As I munched on a bag of shredded cheese, I found myself peering out the window at Jack's house. He was still slumped at the table on his porch, drinking himself into oblivion by the wavering light of his citronella candle. I shook my head and wandered back to bed. When I finally did drift off, I dreamed that I was running through a jungle. Everyone had left me behind and I was alone. In the distance, I could hear the whir of the choppers firing up. If they left me behind, there'd be no way to get home again. When I left for work early in the morning, Jack was no longer on the porch. The beer can was still lying in his lawn, dented on one side and swarming with ants. When I got home that afternoon, the beer can was gone and his lawn had been mowed. Jack himself was nowhere to be seen. I tried to busy myself with some painting. I wanted to get done in the basement, but I gave up pretty quickly and laid out on the couch instead. I ate some leftover pizza and had a snooze while the weather channel blabbled quietly in the background. I awoke to a knock on the door, firm and insistent. It was Jack. He looked distinctly unwell. His eyes were bloodshot. He said, Got you sleeping, did I? Young fellow like you shouldn't be snoozing away his youth. You'd sleep in your grave. I blinked in the stagnant sunshine and mumbled, What time is it? It's time for a car ride. 
Jack said crisply. Go take a piss, brush your teeth. You got yourself a decent case of shit breath going on. I was still half asleep and I had no idea what to say. His last words to me had been, get the fuck out of here. And now he wanted to go for a drive. What the hell was going on? Jack crossed his arms impatiently and said, Don't break my balls, okay? I was half in the bag. I wasn't expecting to answer that kind of question. I got out of line. I apologize. Now, hurry up. Get yourself presentable. Your hair is all fucked up. You look like a rooster. I gave him a bleary nod and scrubbed my palms over my eyes. Okay, I said. Just give me a few minutes. Hurry it up, Jack called over his shoulder. We're going to get ourselves some ice cream. True to his word, Jack drove us down to a boardwalk and he bought us both a double scoop of Dutch chocolate and a waffle cone. We sat down on a beach facing the lake. We ate our ice cream in silence. Jack took a breather from his ice cream and groaned. First thing I've eaten all day. And hung over like a son of a bitch this morning. In a neutral tone, I said, yeah, I bet. I waited to see what was coming next. Jack looked at the lake, his eyes hidden behind a pair of ancient-looking Ray-Bans. He said, If I get hammered enough, I get a, a night of nothingness, no dreams. It's a blessing. He turned to me and asked, You have a girlfriend? I've been there for a week and I ain't seen broads come around yet. I shrugged and answered, Not anymore. I was living with a girl, but it ended a little while ago. I moved out. That's why I'm your new neighbor. Yeah, it happens, Jack murmured. How many kids? No, we hadn't even talked about that yet. Jack gave me an approving nod. People always think having kids will fix their relationship. It doesn't work. Jack gave the remnant of his cone a sour look and tossed it onto the sidewalk. It was immediately snatched up by a seagull, who was abruptly swarmed by a small mob of other seagulls. The cone was torn into fragments during this brief struggle, and they all flew away with... nothing. Jack snorted. See that? That's us. That's how they make us live. Nothing's worth a shit no more. Agreed, I said with a nod. Things always go up and down, though. There's good times, bad times. Right now, things are getting worse. Hopefully it'll get better again soon. There's going to be another war, Jack grumbled darkly. You wait and see. That's a cycle. Economy starts to limp along. Suddenly we're in another war. And who do we send to fight the war? Our kids. That's who. We send our kids off to fight and die in a foreign land. No questions asked. 18, 19 year old. Off they go. There was a heavy blanket of expectancy in the air between us. We could sense that he wanted to talk, but I wasn't sure if I was prepared for the darkness that was bubbling inside of him. I threw the last piece of my cone to the gulls, which set off another noisy brawl amongst the lurking seagulls. Trying to sound casual, I said, Is that how old you were when you got your draft card? Jack leaned back with a strangled groan and gently massaged his temples. He said, Yeah, I was 18. I come home from playing basketball down at the park, and there it was, sitting on the kitchen table with the rest of the mail. I was a sheltered, middle-class kid from a small town. I didn't want to leave everything I'd ever known to go to Vietnam. If I had to go, I sure as hell didn't want to be anywhere near a combat zone. But Dad took me aside before I left. He said, I heard it's safer in the Army. Stay away from the Marines. It's not how things work. I gave him a puzzled frown and said, Wait a minute, then how did you end up in the Marines? Well, now, Jack drawled. That's a funny story. After they were done with the physicals, they line up in a long row and start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Marine. And I was one of the guys who got picked to be a Marine. I called home from a payphone and told my dad what happened. He went quiet for a second. And he said, You're going overseas, Jack, be brave and come home. And he handed the phone over to Ma because there's nothing else to say. You know, I was going to war. How was that? And I said, that's crazy. You didn't have a choice? It's, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah, I agree. So off I went to 
Paris Island for boot camp. And on the first night, I could hear some of the guys crying to themselves in the dark. Some looked like they didn't even shave yet. Next morning, someone got smart with a drill instructor. He turned around and knocked the poor bastard six feet back into a wall. The shit like that happened all the time. I remember I remember there was a kid named uh, Jansen or Anderson, uh, something like that. And he was slow as molasses, stubborn as a mule. He was always bringing heat on the rest of us. And believe me, you didn't want any heat. Things were hard enough already, so we all jumped on him one night. We held him down in his bunk with a sheet, and we told him to stop fucking up. And we beat the shit out of him. He just beat his stupid ass like a pinata. Didn't make him any faster, smarter. It was satisfying. That's what it was like on Paris Island. Jack saw my disturbed expression and gave me a crooked smirk. He said, You'd be surprised how fast it started to seem normal. When you're young, you adapt real quick. Anyway, after I completed the infantry training, I, I was sent back home for a month. Everyone treated me like a ghost, like I was already gone. The next stop was Vietnam. I arrived in Da Nang just in time for the Tet Offensive. The first week in country, and boom, shit hit the fan. Jack heaved himself onto his feet and fished his car keys out of his pocket. He said, I'm tired of watching the shithawks fight for scraps. Let's go. On the ride back home, Jack abruptly turned to me and said, I used to be a dad. Well, no shit, I had a son. His name was Ben. His use of the past tense pricked up my ears. I said, sorry for your loss. Can I ask what happened? Jack's lips twitched in a bitter, humorless smile. He said, Ben ran away when he was 17. They found him dead a year later. He was overdosed in a phone booth. I felt my heart sink. He said, that's really awful, Jack. I, I can't imagine. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it, it was a rough one. After he was gone, my wife accused me of doing my best to push people away. I asked her, then why are you still here? And she said, I don't know anymore. It was long before she packed her bags and left a note on the fridge. He pulled his aging Buick into his driveway and said, Well, there you go, young fella. <laughs> Say, why don't you come by again tomorrow night? I won't throw your beer in the yard this time, I promise. I hesitated, then gave him a noncommittal shrug and said, I'll give you a solid maybe. How's that sound? I do have work early in the morning. Jack gave me a knowing look and said, It's like slowing down to gawk at a car wreck, isn't it? You're a little ashamed of yourself for wanting to see more, but that doesn't stop you from trying to get a better look. I don't shake your head. Just admit it. Don't be a pussy. I tried to deny it, but the words dried up in my throat. He was right. You're a cagey old bastard, aren't you? I asked softly. Okay. I'll be over around dusk. Sound good? Ain't nothing good left in the world, Jack retorted. But yeah, that's fine. See you then, neighbor. For the rest of the night, all I could think about was his sour grin, and him saying, ain't nothing good left in this world. I was starting to have a vague idea where this all might be headed, and I didn't think I was prepared to deal with it. I hoped I was wrong. Sometimes, sometimes it's good to be wrong. Just like confession, it can be Good for the soul. As the sun slid past the horizon, I climbed Jack's front steps and plopped down across from Meta's table. The flame of the citronella candle was wavering in a tepid breeze, soon to be stifled under a motionless blanket of twilight. I set my beer on the table and said, Evening, Jack. How's it going? 
He tapped his glass of rum and said, Not so bad. It's the first drink I've had all day. Been saving up for tonight. I popped open a beer and took a long swallow. I said, From what you told me, I don't blame you for having a few drinks at night. Oh, I have more than a few, Jack snorted. He took a small sip from his glass and chased it with a large swallow. He gasped. It's better. I needed that. How you been doing, kid? You gonna settle in? Little by little, yeah. Still feels strange to be alone. You wait. And get used to it, Jack assured me. And then you start to like it. When you're alone, no one cluttering up your life with their bullshit. I guess so, I said reluctantly. It can be nice sometimes, too. There was an awkward silence. Jack lit a cigarette and rasped. Well, let's get this rolling. Where do you want me to start? Cautiously, I said. You were talking about your son yesterday. You feel like telling me more? I mean, you don't have to, but I... thought maybe you'd like to get Ben. Jack interrupted. His name was Ben. He raised the glass to his lips. I saw that he was shaking a tiny bit. He exhaled a cloud of rum fumes and mumbled. I never told anyone the whole story. Well, here it goes. Ben was a good kid. He behaved himself. Minded his mother. I was always hard on him, though. I was afraid that the world would eat him alive if he was too weak, so I tried my best to make him tough. He started getting an attitude with me when he got a little older. Being defiant just made me come down on him even harder. When he was a teenager, sometimes I'd get fed up with his smug little face. You know, I get I get fed up, I'd take him out to the garage, I'd scream at him, shove him around, maybe even smack him up a little. Man, he'd never fight back. I wanted him to fight back. But he wouldn't do it. He'd just hide his face and he'd wait for it to be over. I looked at him with dismay and said, that, that isn't discipline, Jack. That's, that's, that's abuse. You, you do understand that. It wasn't considered abuse back then, Jack countered. Parents always smacked their kids, kept them in line. Some people used their belts, wooden spoon, maybe even a fly swatter. It didn't hurt them permanently, just taught them a lesson. I shook my head and demanded, what lesson? That it's okay to use violence to control someone? Uh, you're one of those people, Jack rumbled. There's no reaching your kind of people. You live up your own ass. You want to hear this or not? I clamped down my urge to argue this point further and said, yeah, yeah, I do. Keep on. Anyway, after Ben turned 16, he started cutting class all the time. His grades tanked. He always stayed out late. He wouldn't tell us where he'd been or where he was going. He was stuck at home. He locked himself in the bedroom. Me and, me and him tried our best to avoid each other. It's pretty much done with the kid. I guess he was probably done with me too. Whenever we were in the same room together, you could just cut the tension with a knife. Something was ready to go. And then it did. I waited for him to elaborate, but Jack fell silent. What was the final straw? I brought it. What happened? In a lifeless tone, Jack muttered, I was on my way to bed one night, and I caught him smoking weed in his room. He tried to blow it out of his window, but I could still smell it in the hallway. His mother was already asleep. We were having our own problems. And that's a different story. So I come busting in and catch him red-handed. I made him toss the dope out the window. I said, is that why your grades ain't worth a shit? Is this why you hide away in your room all the time? He wouldn't give me an answer. He just stared at nothing, waited for me to stop. Made me even madder, you know, I could barely contain myself. So I pushed him into the hallway, told him, go out to the garage, we're going to sort this out. 
took him out of the garage, ripped into him for a while, just kept getting madder and madder, seeing red. He just standing there with his head down the whole time, waiting for it to be over. And Jesus Christ, that pissed me off so bad. I ended up whacking him across the face with a backhand. He stumbled into the shelf, knocked over a can of paint on the floor. I pointed at the paint sprayer and yelled, Look at that, you little prick. You need to clean that up. And then... He got this look... on his face, you know, like... He's about to explode, I thought. Here it comes. Finally, he's gonna fight back. But he didn't swing at me. He, uh... Jack's voice became husky and thick. He cleared his throat, took a deep swallow from his glass. You could see a film of tears gleaming in his eyes in the candlelight. He, uh, he picked himself up, straight and tall. He, he looks me in the eye, he says, Dad, I'm gay. And I... I I just froze up like a statue. I couldn't believe it. But at the same time, I wasn't surprised. I think I'd always known that about him. I just didn't want it to be true. I grabbed him. I shoved him into the wall. I couldn't make any sense out of what he was saying. I just kept saying, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? Benny didn't cower away from me. Not this time. He pushed me back. He said, you know what it means. It means I'm gay. Well, Jack muttered, that was that. I told him, put your fucking hands up. I hit him in the stomach. He dropped to the floor, so I hauled back to his feet, gave him a brisk shake. I yelled, put your fucking hands up. Fight me. Come on. He was still trying to catch his breath. He just shook his head, crouched against the wall. I, I was so fucking mad. I... Could have killed him, I told him. There ain't gonna be any of that shit under my roof, do you understand me? What's your mother gonna say? What do you think this is gonna do to your mother? He said, it's not gonna do anything to mom because it's not her life, it's mine. So that was that. I didn't want to hear any more of it. I told him, you need to pack your shit and get the fuck out of my house. He said, I'll leave tonight. You won't ever see me again. And he did. Jack whispered. When my alarm went off in the morning, he was gone. I realized I was leaning forward in my chair. My hands gripped together in a knot of tension. I sat up straight and gulped down some beer. It barely even started and it was already getting rough. Even so, I wanted to hear the rest of Jack's story, his confession, as it were. I wanted every awful detail because he was right. We all have a morbid fascination with the dark side of humanity. Infamy turns bad people into pseudo-celebrities, reviled and revered at the same time. People love to clutch their pearls when they look at the underbelly of society, but they still look. Don't they? Jack angrily wiped his sleeve across his eyes. He croaked. Ben was wrong. I saw him one more time before he died. It was about eight months after he left. I was driving home on Fifth Avenue on my way home. I saw Ben sitting on a curb. He was all by himself. I only saw him for a couple seconds, but I'm pretty sure he had a black eye. He was looking awfully thin. Looked like he hadn't eaten a square meal in weeks. I shook my head in dismay. I said, He looked that bad and you didn't stop to talk to him? Jack quavered. No, I didn't stop. I thought to myself, that's your son for Christ's sake. Turn around and go back. But I didn't. I just kept driving. A few months later, he was dead. I never told his mother I saw him that day. She'll never know the truth. I prompted. What's the truth? 
Say it out loud. Jack took a bigger swallow from his glass and licked his lips. He breathed. I could have saved him, but I didn't. Didn't have nothing to do with him being gay. I didn't save him because I didn't want to admit I was wrong. My own pride was more important than my son. I whispered. Oh, there it is. And half my beer suddenly disappeared down my throat. I belched behind my hand and took in a deep cleansing breath. Now my shining moment, Jack muttered. It haunts me every day. I said, yeah. No way to spin that one and make it seem better. It was a really fucked up thing to do. But you understand that. It's a start, I guess. I mean, fucking hell, man. I really don't know what to say. Let's change the subject. How about that? You want to hear about Vietnam? He muttered, and he poured himself some more rum. Of course you do. You've seen the movies, now you want to know what it was really like. I nodded and said, guilty as charged. Tell me about the war. Jack studied his glass and gathered his thoughts. He said, it wasn't like World War II. It was guerrilla warfare. Top brass said, we've got more troops, more firepower, so we'll eventually win. Those guys didn't understand the jungle. They didn't understand the enemy. Charlie was defending his country from invaders. He had something to believe in us. We didn't want to be there. Jack stopped talking and nursed his drink in silence. Go on, I prompted. And he gave me a disgruntled look. We got all night. Give me time to figure out how to say it. I'm not much of a talker. I apologized. I waited for him to continue. Anyway, he grumbled. These people were tough as nails. Live in underground tunnels, eat nothing but rice for weeks on end. You come to a village, they'd tell you there were no VC hiding there. And you start poking around, you'd end up finding the entrance to a tunnel and a pig pen. VC were different from the NVA. They didn't always look like soldiers. They could look like anybody. They were everywhere, nowhere, all at once. Paranoia would get to you after a while. Anyone you saw might secretly be the enemy. And even when the VC weren't around, you had to watch out for their booby traps. And my best friends almost died because he got stuck in a punji stick. I asked, what's a, what's a punji stick? The Jack made a sour face. The bamboo pole with a sharp point. He'd hide them in a pit. They'd put them in a ditch on either side of a trail. A sniper opens fire. You all dive into the ditch. Someone gets impaled on a stick. He'd smear the pointy end with shit. Get a raging infection in no time. I made a disgusted face and shuddered. I said, worse something else, isn't it? Jack gave me a grim look. It wasn't just the Kong you needed to watch out for. Even the jungle wanted to kill you. There were vipers, venomous centipedes, parasites, leeches, all kinds of shit out there. Yeah, that's right. Leeches, huge, slimy fucking things. You'd wake up in the morning and peel off six, eight, ten of those motherfuckers. Mosquitoes were horrible, too. They carried dengue fever and malaria. I had to take a pill every day so we wouldn't get sick. We called it the Daily Daily. Jack smirked a bit in my obvious discomfort. He said, you asked for details, didn't you? Shit, I barely scratched the surface. I popped open another beer and tipped it back. I was starting to get a buzz. I was pretty sure I was going to need it. I let out another discreet belch and asked, what's your best memory from the war? Jack smiled a little. He said, we just finished taking back a city called Hugh. Fighting from house to house, street to street. I barely ate and got any sleep for the whole time. I was running on a combination of dexedrin and fear. I was so fucking scared that whole time. I can't even imagine. Anyway, we found all these big earthenware jars of rice wine in a cellar. 
After the nightmare we just went through, you better believe we wanted to get in that wine pretty bad. We all were scared. The NVA poisoned it before they left. Finally, one of the guys said, oh, fuck it, and he started drinking. So we all sat in a circle and waited to see if he was going to die. He didn't die. So we all got drunk that night. I snorted some involuntary laughter and said, this is pretty dark, man. They were dark times. Jack grinned. I could tell he was already sliding feet first into the bottle, as he probably did every night. But this time was going to be different. Tonight, Jack Werner was going to let it all out. He was going to lay it all bare for his audience, for one. And I was feeling things might get downright ugly. I wasn't just ready for it. I wanted it. I was darkly fascinated by Jack because he was a shit human being. If it weren't for the war, Jack's life probably would have taken an entirely different trajectory. The powers that be had stolen his youth and murdered his innocence. After all, shit human beings aren't born that way. Everyone's shaped by their environment, and Jack was no different. I raised my can and said, Well, for what it's worth, I'm glad you didn't get poisoned. And What's next? How about you tell me the story of how you met your wife? Jack looked bemused by this question. He said, You're really picking at some old wounds tonight, ain't you? Oh, well, I met her at an apple orchard. We both got hired on for the fall apple harvest. It's hard work. She never complained. Always smiling, always trying her best. I fell for it pretty hard. Eventually, she took a shine to me, too. She was the one who convinced me to settle down, find a stable job, finally drop some roots. That first year together, it was... Magic. I stopped having so many nightmares. I didn't feel so goddamn detached from everything, you know? I feel like I was part of my surroundings again. And then, then we went to go see the deer hunter. Things started to go south after that. I was having nightmares again. Started drinking to drown him out. And a fight at work. Got fired. Lost a good job at an auto plant all because I had a bitch of a hangover and I was feeling mean. The wife was furious at me. She stood over me at the kitchen table and yelled, How are we supposed to pay for this house we just bought? What are we going to do? I told her maybe you should stop yelling and go pick some fucking apples. She went ballistic. She slapped me across the face. I said, Don't you ever raise your hand to me again, stupid bitch. I'll be damned if she didn't try it again, Jack said in a wondering tone. That was the last straw. I grabbed her by the throat. I pulled her up against the fridge. I choked her until she was red in the face. I told her, you're trying to push buttons on me, woman. Don't you dare push that button. Don't you fucking dare. I stared at Jack in dismay. I exclaimed, Jesus Christ, man. What? Why would you do that to your wife? Jack narrowed his eyes and said, Go ahead and clutch your pearls. I didn't hurt her. I just showed her what would happen if she crossed the line. She never tried anything like that again. She learned her lesson. I closed my eyes and said, Forget it. Just tell me about your divorce. Why did she finally leave you? Ben died. Jack answered in a cold, flat tone. His smile was gone. After that, there wasn't nothing left to hold it together. We didn't love each other anymore. We didn't even like each other. She filed for divorce a few months after the funeral. It's like that it was done. I started to ask another question, and Jack shushed me with a raised finger. He said... Okay, your turn. How about you? Why are you sitting here on my porch? Why aren't you still with your better half? I felt my jaw tighten in a flare of resentment. I shot back. We aren't talking about me. We're talking about you. And why not? 
Zack demanded. His smile was back, but now it was gleaming with hostility. You asked me about my divorce. I'm asking you about yours. What happened? I glared at him and I snapped. She fell for a guy at work and kicked me out. Well, fuck a duck, Jack wheezed. He toasted me back with a glass of rum. Ain't that some shit? What did you do to make her turn to another man? I gave him a side eye and muttered, "What? What's that supposed to mean? She wanted to be with you, then she didn't, Jack explained politely. So what happened? I stabbed a finger at him and hissed, It's none of your business. Do you want me to leave? I'll go right now. Oh, now he wants to leave, Jack said. He was still smiling. Fine, forget I said anything. Back to me, I guess. Ask me something. Go ahead. I clamped down my anger. That was exactly the response he was looking for, so I would deny him the pleasure. I shrugged it off and said, Okay, more questions. How about... Uh, what was it like for you when you came back from the war? Jack studied his glass of rum, looking for assurance within its murky depths. Well, he drawled. I was gone for 13 months. I got home, a lot of things had changed. Guys my age were running around with long hair. They were tie-dye shirts, miniskirts. I had no idea this cultural revolution was happening, not until I got off the plane and saw it for myself. I fully expected to come home a hero, but I was dead wrong. Y'all fucking hated us. On the day I came back to America, someone spit on me, called me a baby killer. I had just gotten out of a taxi with all my gear, and this girl came up to me and said, Welcome back, baby killer. Then she spit on me and she walked away. I just stared at her with my mouth open. This... Fucking spoiled brat. This soft little child who had never had to lift a finger in her entire life. She comes clomping up in her sandals and her bell-bottom jeans. She spits on me. A freaking baby killer? As if that's all I did all day. Just walking around, shooting babies. Jesus Christ. Should have punched her in the throat. That wasn't right. But people did have plenty to be mad about, I interjected. There was a war going on that nobody wanted. Protests were being shut down by the cops. A, a bunch of kids ended up getting shot by the National Guard at Kent State University. Nobody had any right to give you a hard time about your service, but they did have a reason to be angry. Jack scoffed at me and said, It's not like I had a choice in the matter, did I? I wasn't going to get a college deferment like all the smart kids. I wasn't going to dodge the draft or run away to Canada like all the rich kids either. The rest of us, we didn't, we didn't have a choice. All those peaceniks and protesters thought they knew what was going on. They didn't understand the reality of the situation. The worst thing to me was that even though most of them were dumb as fuck, they were still right. It was a bullshit war. If we got involved for bullshit reasons, in the end, what do we do? We gave up. We let the NVA take over all those lives, all the suffering, the sacrifices. It means nothing. I felt a pang of pity in my heart. And it struck me that almost nothing is completely black or white in the world. I mean, the truth... The truth is that Reality is really fucking complicated, and anyone who thinks otherwise is lying to themselves. I adapted after a while. Jack continued. I grew my hair out to fit in, tried to lead the life they wanted you to lead. You know, the house, the kid, the green lawns, church suppers, all that horse shit. I tried, but it didn't work. The war was many years and thousands of miles behind me. I could still hear the echoes. They never fade away. I absorbed his answer and ruminated on my next question as I drank my beer. I drained the can and popped open another one. 
How many people did you kill? Faintly, Jack said. I don't really know. In the heat of battle, it can be hard to say who killed who. Probably 15, 20, maybe more. None of them were babies. Were they all soldiers, though? Without hesitation, Jack said, No, I don't think so. But I can't say they weren't the enemy, either. That's how it is. There's always some collateral damage in a war. People get caught in a crossfire. I gritted my teeth at the casual and boozy brashness of the statement. I leaned closer and snapped. How about your own family? Were they collateral damage, too? Did they get caught in the crossfire? Jack froze in his chair. He gave me a dark stare from across the table and poured himself some more booze. He croaked. I guess that's a fair point. And you're probably not wrong, but you are crossing a line, little buddy. Make sure you stay away from that line. I held his gaze and asked, Why? You don't seem to care much about crossing lines. Why do you think you're entitled to make other people miserable? He sneered. So, you're Mr. Perfect over here, are you? Your woman didn't seem to think so, did she? I gave him an antagonistic smile, followed by an insultingly enthusiastic thumbs up. I said, good one, Jack. Got you angry, didn't I? I can tell it's been a while since anyone pushed back against your rancid bullshit. Let me tell you something, old man. It's not because people are afraid of you. It's because you don't know anyone who cares. Jack opened his mouth to spit out a rebuttal, but I raised my voice and cut him off. I said, be quiet. Listen, asshole. Let me explain what I mean. When you're being shitty to a stranger behind a cash register, they honestly don't give a fuck. You know why? Because you'll be gone in a minute or two and they won't have to deal with you anymore. That's what I'm talking about, Jack. No one cares enough to engage with you. Get it? But it's different when you're being a prick to someone close to you, isn't it? I mean, they push back. And you don't like that very much. That's why you drove everyone away, because you can't handle the consequences of your own actions. Jack snarled. Who the fuck do you think you are? You don't know me. You don't know about my life. You sure as hell don't know about the war. You don't know anything at all, so don't you use your tone with me. Not me, motherfucker. Don't you dare. Why not? I demanded. Because you were in a war 50 years ago? How long is that going to be your crutch, old man? Are you going to snivel about it forever? Fucking let it go, for Christ's sake. Jack shoved his chair back and shot to his feet, spilling a wave of beer, rum, and citronella across the table in the process. He panted, shut your mouth. That's not how it goes, dickhead. I do the talking. You shut the fuck up and listen. Talk to me again like that. And I swear to God, I'll knock your dick in the dirt. I stood up too. My face burning in the darkness. I beckoned him with a curled finger and said, I'm not Ben. I'll fight back. I'll give you what you're looking for. Jack's fist lashed out like a whip and connected with my chin. I stumbled back with stars in my eyes. He shoved the table out of his way and came for me, splashing beer and rum all over the splintering floorboards underfoot. I stepped forward with my fist clenched, and I promptly caught a sharp jab in my mouth. I charged into Jack's next punch with my head down, and I tackled him around the waist. We slipped into the puddle of booze, and I landed on top of him. Jack let out a sharp cry of pain when he hit the deck. His fingers started clawing for my eyes. I shoved his hands away and clobbered him in the face. He tried to cover up his head with his arms, so I pinned them with my knees and hit him again. I popped him a third time and drew back my fist to give him a fourth. Something jagged and primal had been released from the depths of my soul. I wanted to punch his face into oblivion. I, I wanted to kill him. I hissed, are you done, fuckhead? You want some more? Jack smiled up at me and I saw blood in his teeth. He wheezed, come on, coward, keep going. I looked down at his wild eyes, his bleeding face, and just like that, my rage was gone. I felt... dirty. 
They whispered, no, I won't do it. I heard a door swing open somewhere across the street and a woman shouted, if you don't knock it off over there, I'm going to call the cops. I stood up on shaky legs and spat a mouthful of blood over the railing. I hollered back, everything's fine, mind your own business and go to bed. Jack sat up and mumbled, you tell her, boss, give her hell. I felt my stomach do a lazy roll in my gut. I grimly swallowed down a wave of nausea and crouched down to stare Jack in his eyes. I said, last question, Jack. What's the worst thing you ever did? Tell me the truth, you shitty old bastard. Let it all out. I don't think Jack was going to answer, but he did. I don't know. He said quietly. I've asked myself that question time and time again, and I just don't know. When I was a kid, I never imagined I'd ever kill someone. Never thought I'd break someone's face with the butt of a rifle. But that's what I did. I killed people. I burned their homes. Burned their crops. Burned their livestock. Burned their entire lives to the ground, and then I moved on. I did so many horrible things with that. We don't need hell. This is enough. I waited to see if there was more, but Jack was finished talking. There's nothing more to say. I looked up at the stars shining so soft and clean in their lovely perch, far away from the filth and the madness of humankind. I took a deep breath and I said, I'm going home. Jack held his ribs with one hand and he pulled himself to his feet with the other, clutching at the table for support. He lifted his shirt to wipe blood off his face and murmured, There's nothing good in this world. Not now, not then, not ever. I never stop, skin. There's no way out. I paused on the bottom step and I said, I pity you, Jack. I don't know what else to say except... Fuck you. Fuck off. Whatever happened here... It's done. Don't ever talk to me again. I walked away without looking back. I marched directly into my bathroom and I cleaned up my face. I had a few cuts in my mouth and split in my upper lip. There was nothing too serious. When I was done, I struggled out of my pants, crawled into bed. I was drunk. The room was spinning in a large, lazy circle. As I faded to sleep, I could hear Jack crooning. It never stops, kid. And there's no way out. I dreamed I was running through the jungle again. I could see the choppers in a clearing far ahead. I was trying to reach them, but my gear was too heavy and I was too far away. In just a few seconds, they'd be flying up over the treetops, soaring back to freedom. I'd be left behind. I'd have to wake up before the choppers left the ground. I'd have to wake up stop him. My eyes flew open, and I hopped out of bed. I knew what he was going to do, and for better or worse, I had to save him. For the sake of my own soul, I, I had to try. It was still dark outside. Jack's car was idling in the driveway. A garden hose was taped to the exhaust pipe. It was looped around the car to the driver's side window, and I could see Jack sitting behind the wheel. His eyes were open, but they were staring into the void. The doors were locked. I ripped away the strip of duct tape from the top of the window and smashed it with a rock. Jack let out a confused grunt as I dragged him onto the front lawn. He curled up onto his side and started to weakly cough into the grass. My head was pounding with a ferocious headache, and the exertion from dragging a fully grown man didn't help much. I knelt down beside him in the wet grass and gasped, You can't die yet. You're not like this. He pushed himself up into a sitting position with a squawk of pain. He said, Why not? Why'd you stop me? I rubbed my temples inside. Could still do some good for you, Di. It's not too late. You could 
You make this world a slightly better place. They gave me an incredulous look and asked, How the hell am I supposed to do that? I'm going to volunteer at a soup kitchen? The fuck are you even talking about? I said, I don't know how you'll do it. Or if you'll even try. All I know for sure is that you're a human being. Will you take it from there is up to you. I helped him to his feet. He held his left side and gasped. I think I cracked a rib earlier. Guess I deserved it. I don't know if you deserved it. But I'm not sorry, I told him. I started to walk away. I called over my shoulder. Phone the cops if you want to press charges. I'll show them my lip. Maybe they'll end up charging us both. I don't care. If not, then I wish you good luck in life. I hope you find peace. I left Jack standing there in his yard with his cracked rib and his swollen face. I wasn't proud of myself, but I wasn't ashamed either. In real life, the hero and the villain often the same person. Most situations aren't black and white, and the echoes of the past don't need to follow us into the future. These are all different truths. But that doesn't make them any less true. Some form of redemption is always lurking right around the corner. We all, we all have time to do some good before we're gone. If Jack can do it, so can you. He got sober and started a support group for veterans. You can hear them out in his backyard when the weather's fair, speaking in hushed tones about their experiences both on and off the battlefield. Sometimes it's laughter. Other times it's anger and tears. They're a circle of shattered souls, but with the support of their peers, they're piecing themselves together the best they can. Personally, I think it's sort of beautiful. To this day, Jack and I are still not on speaking terms. I don't think he'd ever be able to look at me in the eye again. I mean, I'm glad he's doing well, but I have no need to communicate with him. I'd always be silently judging him for his actions in the past, and that wouldn't be good for either one of us. After a lot of self-reflection, I was finally able to face my own demons. It took time to learn that I can share my time with someone else and still, still belong to myself. I recently started seeing someone new. Neither of us wants to rush in anything heavy. It's nice to just enjoy someone's company and not feel any pressure. It's, I mean, if anything, it's actually making us closer. No expectations means no disappointments. And we both like that just fine. I have nothing else to say, except to remind you that the past is behind you, and the future is out of your reach. The present is where we exist, right here. And the perfect time to turn it all around is right now. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at Chilling. If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you can select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to 
Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Makeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pepper Squeezer, Gavis, Joseph Calarudo, Who would it be? Dante Kincaid, Lockdown 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff Joey's Cultist, Love You M M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Clark, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Escabine, Braden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sect Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Inchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Chelly J, Michael Mel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Buster Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, and Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here or down there or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night and sweet dreams.